Good morning. All right. Hello, my name is Greg Wilson. I am an HIV positive black gay man. I'm also senior manager at In the Meantime Men's Group Inc. And I serve as a commissioner on Los Angeles County's Commission of HIV. 14 years ago today, I found out I was HIV positive. After several conversations with Jeffrey King, the executive director of In the Meantime, we discussed the concerns that community, cab members, as well as my peers have been asking, which is why there is not a greater focus around National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day, especially if the black community is highly impacted and affected by HIV and AIDS, and many of the funding streams in Los Angeles County are based upon the disproportionate impact of the black community. NBAD is recognized on February 7th, and it is an initiative that began in 1999 as a grassroots effort that aimed to raise awareness regarding HIV and AIDS, especially after realizing the devastating impact that it's had on the black community at large. Thank you to the commission for being open and honoring the request of acknowledging NBAD, allowing the conversations and concerns of community to be brought to the LA County Commission on HIV and outside of our agencies to actually hear from members and constituents who live, love, and work within the black community. The support of allies can be demonstrated by learning, listening, and growing an unbiased understanding of various perspectives that will be shared with you not only today, but every day. It's important that we address HIV in the black community beyond stigma. We must look at the day-to-day -day challenges, whether it's cost of living, racism, poverty, anti-trans sentiment, oppression, as well as other factors. There are layers. Ultimately, these layers create, the boil, create a boil maker which leads to the outcomes that we are now seeing. It's difficult to make a community response to HIV when it's been so highly stigmatized in, by, with homophobia. It's also difficult when we aren't often enough hearing from all facets of the black community directly. I believe today's panel is a great start to a conversation and discussion that is necessary. The commission is charged with listening to community needs and issues and learning from the communities most affected by HIV and respecting their leadership to develop sound programs, policies, outcomes, and being held accountable to assure that the conversation doesn't end here today. Though I don't think it's realistic to fully address all of the things needed in the time allotted, there are three object objectives that should be given particular attention that I would like to recommend. It's in my hopes that the commission will consider these, these three formal recommendations as we move forward into 2019 as future agenda items for future commission meetings. One, by the end of the panel discussion, identify specific strategies on how the commission can support black leaders and community stakeholders in their efforts to end HIV in the black community. Two, by the end of the panel discussion, identify HIV, HIV prevention and treatment best practices in the black community. And three, by the end of the panel discussion, identify specific strategies to reduce HIV stigma in the black community. Now, I would like to introduce our panel and our moderator for the day. Panelists, we have Tracy Bivens Davis. She's a commissioner. Round of applause. <laughs> we have Dr. William King. He's a commissioner. Please give him a round of applause. We have Lucky Fuller, commissioner. And we have Javante Wilson, in the meantime, Men's Group's lead HIV tester under the Vulnerable Populations Contract. So now, please give a round of applause for our moderator, Mr. Tim Vincent. So good morning, everybody. And thank you for adjusting the agenda for my horrendous ride over here. Um, Good morning. I'm so grateful, actually, to be here, and I'm, and I'm grateful that this panel has been um, convened to really help illuminate and talk about the challenges that many people face, or most of us face, actually, in the black communities related to HIV. I've been doing this work for a very long time, for over 
almost three decades, basically, in direct service work and doing a lot of training and technical assistance all over the country. And I'm just grateful for this opportunity. So what's, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to ask about three main questions to the group. Um, and we have about an hour. So each of them hopefully will weigh in on, on each question. Uh, and we hopefully we'll have some discussion too. So it won't just be one person, one person, one person, one person. So that's how it's going to go. We ready to go? You guys, you, I know you're ready to go. So here, here, here is, we're not going to do that, right? Here is the first question. I know that you also had it in your, did they get that in your pack, packet, the data that's, that's right there? Okay, because that's, that's also important as a context for what we're talking about. So here's the first question. What is your individual perception and what do you feel the community's perception is of the state of HIV in the black community in 2019? I'm going to actually start with Tracy. Is that okay with you? It's going to be. <laughs> it's going to be okay. No, I appreciate that. Uh, it has to be. Okay, so... Um, my perception. We've made several advancements through treatment and intervention. Uh, we're experiencing a greater interge intergenerational flux. We're more in a more intergenerational place than we've ever been before. But it requires that we address chronic conditions with bookend, keep book, with bookend communities, those who are younger and those who are wiser, shall we say. <laughs> People are living longer, but they have other conditions that really require specialty care, so we, engage, we need to engage specialists a lot deeper into our systems of care. We have a demand on our systems that, help meet, that need to help meet those needs. We also need to, uh, are increasing our mobilization efforts in some places and in some spaces through projects like, like U equals U or uh, programs that are aimed at sustaining viral loads. And, we also have some people who are quite knowledgeable and others who deserve some attention. But my perception really is, honestly, we're still very segmented. Mm -hmm. uh, to some degree, we haven't changed much over 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. And the separation is fueled by social determinants of health, but also funding, right? So when a percentage of our community gets their needs met, the outliers don't. Right? We live in a reality that we're people of color, particularly my black folks. I don't use the word African American, so here it goes. We're, impa we're impacted by substance misuse, stigma, shame, mental health, immigration, crime, all of these things that give us inequitable access to something that is a pandemic and not an epidemic. Mm -hmm. We are increasing mm -hmm. amounts of transactional sex. And we're working under a legislation that was equipped to meet a demand of the 1980s and not 2019. We have a workforce that's very unsustainable with people who are isolated from services due to phobia, stigma, shame, and silence. Nor do we really have a history of really sustaining and retaining culturally appropriate and timely interventions that target black folks in particular, particularly those who do not identify same gender loving men. Stigma manifests by our lack of capacity to really change those patterns, right? Because we have these pre-existing ideas and norms that we continue to prescribe to. Um, but it all, stigma also manifests by inter us internally, as well as through the lack of resources and inside of our language that we use when we communicate with one another. We make mistakes when we talk to people. We don't support their trust. We don't support their sex positivity. We uh, avoid difficult conversations. We, uh, we try to pretend like things are in a, this progressive way for everyone, not recognizing that some of us are being left behind when we have those conversations. And to really address this, we need to, ha I have some questions, right? One of my questions is really, where are the programs for, say, trans-identified issues, who, it, it, individuals who don't, subscribe to the construct of an MSM, mm -hmm. right? Where, the, where outside of a clinic setting can a woman go to get support, right? Where are the places and spaces that are safe for her to have child watch, child care, while she's actively engaging in her services? Where do, we need to go to the source, 
We still have a need to go to the source. We try to go where black folks congregate and celebrate our norms. But in those places and spaces, we haven't really penetrated them well. Um, we need policy. We need policy. We need policies that protect our Medicare, secure our Title X, reauthorize the Ryan White Care Act, but also give us access, true access to housing, not building it and assuming we're gonna show up, but building it and helping us get there systemically, right? And not getting there through the jail system, but getting there from the curb to the couch. Um, we need to stop speaking about HIV and silos and pretend like conversations don't need to occur outside of this room. <laughs> uh, we need to add consistency and support for our elders. And we must be held accountable when we avoid talking about populations in our presentations and during planning and in programming. But mostly, we need to mobilize all age groups and mentor our gatekeepers. So when I say, when I think about the last 10 or 15 years, I feel like we've come a long way, but yet we're still at the beginning. Mm. It's beautifully stated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Incredible. Are you ready to go next, Dr. King? Thank you, Tracy, for a very uh, eloquent presentation there. I'm coming from a perspective as an HIV provider. I've been practicing HIV medicine for 14 years. I practice at UCLA. I practice at federally qualified health centers. I opened up my own practice eight, eight years ago in the Crenshaw area, about five minutes away from where I grew up. So I've seen HIV from different perspectives as well. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing that I see also, as Tracy echoed, is that we do have a lot of advancements that have been happening. We're seeing advancements in medications, both in biomedical prevention and biomedical, biomedical treatment as well. But the problem is we still see the numbers are behind in our communities, right? We're still seeing these discrepancies, and we blindly present this information time and time again without asking questions about why. Mm -hmm. That's why I think it's so important that we're having this conversation right now. But as Greg said, we need to continue this, mm -hmm. and we maybe also need to be able to make this into a standing committee. Brown Act concluded. So we look upon these issues to try to figure out what are the positive ways of addressing the problems that we're seeing, the real problems that we're seeing with regards to access to care, mm -hmm. access to HIV treatment, and access to PrEP as well. When you're looking at your slides, you're gonna see time and time again, you're gonna see this cascade of care. And you're gonna see the stratification by racial discrimination, excuse me, racial charges. We're gonna see African Americans are less likely, and that's probably what it is, it is discrimination. <laughs> Mm -hmm. but less likely to be retained in care and less likely to be viral suppressed. If you're not going to be retained in care, you're not going to be virally suppressed. We see the same thing in, in the PrEP cascade as well, too. We know that these medications are 99% or more effective in terms of preventing HIV. However, we do not, again, we're seeing this racial discrimination and, dis and differentiation with regards to African Americans and access, accessing this care. As a provider, I see part of the problem, am I off? As part of the problem is not just getting the patients to the physician, but getting the patients to a willing physician. Do you hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Not every physician wants to treat HIV care. Mm -hmm. Not every physician wants to do PrEP. Not every physician wants to do uh, conversations regarding sexual health. Not every physician wants to have, make sure that their office is trained to make sure when you come to that office that you're respected that their information infrastructure reflects who you are, so you feel comfortable. Yes, we do things with cultural competence with regards to language, because we're mandated to do that. But we should also be charged to do the same thing for individuals who come from different ethnicities, and also from with regards to trans health as well, too. That should be mandated, right? We're talking about the, if, if the problems that happen with regards to African Americans, but we're not looking at what happens to African American trans men and trans women as well. What I also think is fueling the, the, the epidemic is, is that we have lots of information that's out there. I cannot drive on Crenshaw, I cannot drive on Stalker without seeing billboards with regards to STD care and HIV care, and I think that's important. We see that in social media, we see that in TV. But yet, when you look at the Kaiser Family Foundation that talks about access 
at perceptions and information and knowledge, and particularly about our young, our youth, and I'm saying youth because I'm going to be 55 in mon on Monday, <laughs> but our youth, yeah, I'm getting younger, I'm getting stronger. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we see that there is still a knowledge lag behind, right? People do not understand that PrEP is there that can help you in terms of regards to HIV care. Mm -hmm. People do not understand about that treatment uh, can prevent transmission. People do not understand that you still cannot get HIV from glassware and sharing uh, water dishes, et cetera. So there needs to be more of an uptake with regards to that. On my point, we have time and time again that we're educating physicians, we're having them do CMEs, but does that actually translate to individuals actually welcoming people of color, people of color who are HIV positive, people of color who are LGBT, mm -hmm. into their offices. That needs to be the next step that needs to happen. I do think also that the issue, we should talk, I mean, we talked a lot about stigma in here, but I think we need to figure out what are, are going to be the, the mechanisms, the culturally competent, the culturally appropriate mechanisms to make sure that we decrease stigma. We know that stigma, there's less adherence to medications, less adherence to HIV care, less adherence to going to your physician because of perceived stigma or, or actually experienced stigma as well. We need to know that it impacts mental health. We need now, we also know that it impacts your biological health as well too, with the increase in stress, the increase in cortisol levels, that it impacts your immune system. So we need to figure out some culturally appropriate cellular interventions, like that was done in prior, in prior prevention studies, in terms of making sure that we make sure that by the time that we come here a couple of years from now, we're not looking at viral suppression in the 40s, we're looking at viral suppression in the 90s. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Again, incredibly well stated. Are you ready? Thank you very much. So, um, in the way of, of HIV uh, prevention and whatnot, I work with trans men and the trans community. Um, and what we all know is that our trans femme community is upwards of 49% uh, more likely to you know, catch HIV. <laughs> With that being said, those numbers are similar for trans men, but we wouldn't know that because there's some studies, there's some research around that. So that sends a really, really terrible message, especially within our black community, that sends a message to our, our trans brothers that one, I don't need PrEP because I'm not at risk. Two, I don't need condoms because I'm not at risk because this is what the numbers are telling us, right? So <clears throat> even though there are all these research studies that are being done around trans folks, all of those numbers are skewed, one, because in medical facilities, trans men are being counted as women. And in the offshoots um, where we're getting tested, like maybe the testing trucks or these different facilities, we're being tested however we present. So if we are a visibly trans person, we're counted as a trans person. But if we present like I do, Okay, as a trans man, I am often counted as a cisgender man. Okay, so I attribute to those MSM numbers as opposed to transgender male numbers. Okay, so in a lot of different spaces, those numbers are very skewed. As a matter of fact, the CDC did an analysis of 29 studies around trans-specific care around HIV, and only five of those studies specifically looked into trans men. So, <laughs> so, one being that we're not being counted, we don't know what the real numbers look like because a lot of these studies are saying that trans men are less likely to, to uh, pick up HIV, but nobody knows that for a fact. You can't count those numbers, you can't attribute those numbers for fact if we're not being counted correctly. So I think part of that problem is one, let's, let's count, this is a whole demographic that's being missed completely when it comes to HIV and AIDS research, when it comes to PrEP campaigns, even the new PrEP campaigns that are out, um, they reflect trans women, they reflect cis women, they reflect uh, gay men, and they reflect cis men. Okay, but there's no reflection within those campaigns that says anything about trans men. So if there's nothing to reflect us, guess what? We're not paying attention. So being that I deal with trans men, my whole organization is centered around trans men, especially trans men of color. I speak to a lot of trans men and a lot of them have a really scary, scary message that says, 
we don't need it. We're not at risk. These are what the numbers are saying. So I think around that, um, we also need to have competent healthcare around what does it look like to be trans masculine friendly as opposed to being trans friendly. Because the trans femme and the trans masculine as well as the non-binary folks, there's, there's different levels of intersectionality that run through their experiences. And with trans men, I can honestly say I've done the research and there is not one OBGYN provider within LA County that is trans masculine friendly. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like? So that access is not there for trans masculine folks, that, that um, those, those different care mechanisms and support systems are not there for trans masculine folks. On the other side of that, our non-binary folks are being completely missed. Nobody knows what to do with them. And then our trans feminine folks have those resources. They're far and few between, but they have those resources and they have been identified. Thank you very much. So um, I have to look at this question from three different angles. Um, one being a young black gay man, um, another being um, a HIV tester, and the third just being black and being a part of the black community. Um, my perception of the state of HIV um, current day is that we have made a lot of strides, we have made progress. Um, but there are, um, there's still some work that needs to be done. Um, like Dr. King said, um, the lack of getting the information to um, people trying to access the services and the, these new advancements that we have made, um, the lack of information, is, it's, it's missing. Um, so when having conversation with, with clients that come in to take HIV tests, um, one of the questions I ask is, do you know about PrEP or are you currently taking PrEP? And they have, they, some of them have heard of it, um, some of them have not heard of it, heard of it. And the clients that have heard of it, they're not accessing it um, and they have very um, minimum information about it. So I feel like we definitely need to do um, more education um, surrounding PrEP for the people that we are, or who we are actually trying to get to access it and make, sh make sure that them accessing it is a very easy and simple process. Um, another thing uh, would definitely be um, stigma surrounding um, HIV and HIV testing in the black community. I feel like it's definitely looked at as being just a gay disease still in a black gay community, I mean, the black community as a whole. Um, and it needs to be normalized as a people's disease. And the conversation needs to be had surrounding testing regularly um, and normalizing the conversation surrounding HIV. Mm, thank you, thank you. So you all have described in a, I think an eloquent and incredible way, uh, many of the complexities that um, communities are facing to really um, respond to the, the significance that HIV has in our communities. I'm gonna ask you the next question, and you may have answered some of it already because I think you guys talked to some of, about some of it. The next question is, in your opinion, has the black community grasped the significance of some of the um, new methods like that they may not know, like, like PrEP or PEP or treatment as prevention as viable options for reducing the rates of HIV and eradicating HIV from the community? Um, what else do you think needs to happen for people to respond to some of that and really eliminate the disparities that we're seeing? And you may have said some of it already, but anything you want to add? And anybody can start who wants to start. Please. Um, I think around um, the trans community in particular, because like I advocate for the trans community, this is where I do a lot of my work. Um, I think there needs to be a lot of education around the medical providers mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. our folks are not going to access care mm -hmm. because there's nowhere to access care where it's comfortable. And there's, there's nowhere to go in and say, okay, like I'll give you a personal example. I tried to access PrEP. I had to go to three different clinics 
before I could access PrEP because I kept being told, you're not at risk. But at the time, I was with a partner that was positive. Mm. So what makes me not at risk? Mm -hmm. And for trans men as a whole, we are one of the most sexually um, open mm -hmm. demographics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for a lot of trans men, they identify as pansexual, they identify as bisexual, they identify as gay men. So we're, we're the, the most sexually open demographic that there is, and we're sleeping with all of the risk factors. So that would make us even more of a risk factor. There was a, a study done in Canada that realized that the lack of um, research that's being done around the transmasculine community is a risk factor. So if there's, no, if there's nowhere to go get PrEP, if there's nowhere to access it comfortably, if that stigma around being a trans man to access PrEP or any HIV care for that matter is there, if that is there around the medical providers, then why would we go and access any of these things? Okay, there are flyers. I, I saw a flyer the other day and it says, if you are a trans woman, if you're a cis woman, or if you are a male sleeping with another male, then PrEP is for you. Why shouldn't that flyer say, if you are sexually active, PrEP is for you? Mm -hmm. why, why break it down? Mm -hmm. Why say, you know, if you're sexually active, then you're, and, and, and you're, you're having sex, whatever sex, positive sex that is, that is all well and good, but you need to be protected. Mm -hmm. So why break it down into different demographics? That leaves all the rest of those demographics that have not been, been um, noted in those particular campaigns that tells the, the rest of those demographics, you're not a risk factor. So look at, look at the message that's being sent out. Look at what, what, what everyone is getting that are within those demographics. They're telling folks, you're okay. You don't need it. So we don't, and, and on top of that, we're not being counted. So we don't know what the real numbers look like. We don't know how much our, of our trans and non-binary demographics are affected. Thank you. Um, I'll go. Um, so have the black community actually grasped the significance of PrEP, PEP, and um, treatment as mm -hmm. prevention? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't believe my peer group necessarily has, mm -hmm. um, just due to conversations I, uh, that I have had with my peers, mm -hmm. and um, the them actually utilizing the medication the way that it needs to be used. Um, some of them may, um, are under the impression that they could take a pill right before a sexual encounter and have mm -hmm. condomless sex mm -hmm. and be protected, mm -hmm. but not know that they actually have to be adherent to the medication for the medication to actually work mm -hmm. properly. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, yet again, educating um, the people that's accessing these, these services and, and these methods to make sure that they're utilizing them in the way that they need to be utilized mm -hmm. and continuously having conversations so that they know how mm -hmm. to utilize these, um, these new advancements. So I, I, I don't mm -hmm. feel like they have that mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> that, that, that was a quick you know, one. I mean, there's just so much work to do and so much. Mm -hmm. It's not on. No. <laughs> There's just so much more work to do, so much more education that we need to do as well. I'm sorry, Lucky, that you went through that. I, I am very sorry that, we, that you went through that. Mm -hmm. And that's the th kind of messages that we need to hear, and we need to stand up and say this can't happen. Mm -hmm. The idea that the, I've had a tough time mm -hmm. finding OB guys who are trans friendly to do pap smears. And, I've, and the problem is we have to go, as in a magic care network, we have to go with the providers that are contracted with that insurance. And sometimes that's the only insurance we do, so I end up doing them myself. But I can know it can be very traumatic as well, because there's language, there's, there's preparation, there's all these things that we have to do. But we have to train our other providers to be vested, because we're not necessarily going to find these sensitive individuals. So we have to train our primary care providers and I'm, I'm going to invite you to come to some of my medical society meetings to talk to our, our physicians about that. Okay? Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. That's a, what, what was so, and with the issue of PrEP, again, a lot of times what is happening is that it's an issue of business, right? 
although there are different ways of bringing people who are uninsured, who are undocumented into PrEP, still the bottom line is going to that physician's office mm -hmm. and filling out all that paperwork. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have access as a primary care physician mm -hmm. to medical case management because you're a sole provider, mm -hmm. if you don't have access because you're a sole provider or even a small group practice to outside individuals to do that paperwork for you, and particularly individuals are, because of the society, the way that things are, fortunately, and the economy, the way things are, people are losing their insurances. So they may be okay on United, but then they're not okay on Anthem Blue Cross. Mm -hmm. So we have to switch up at that time and do all that paperwork all over again to get this individual paperwork and to get them back on prep. And we don't have access to the five-day pack mm -hmm. as well, too. So again, this person becomes at risk with regards to prep. A lot of individuals that I'm finding that find me search through me through their insurances as well, specifically for a PrEP provider, mm -hmm. an African-American provider as well, which is very important to a lot of individuals, a lot of our constituents. Not to code switch, but a lot of black patients are so satisfied, so happy to be able to walk into the room and see a black physician. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just like somebody wants to see somebody that speaks the same language, they want to have somebody that understands exactly what they are. The fact that I grew up in the community in which I have my practice means a lot. So we want to bring these ideas, these biomedical prevention techniques and HIV treatment to our community, but we need help. We need funds, right? We talk about the distribution of funds within this, uh, this body, but that distribution of funds need to trickle down a little bit more to the people that are doing the work on the street. Mm -hmm. The people that are looking, who constituents and their employees and their mission reflects that of the, who are people that are being devastated by this disease. And not, as, not just ancillary, not just because it's convenient or romantic now, but I've been here doing the work for quite some time. People that have used their credit cards to pay the employees' salaries. They need access mm -hmm. to the funds that we have provided. Mm -hmm. They need access to, the, they, a lot of people need grant writers as well too. Mm -hmm. I was at a meeting where somebody mm -hmm. asked, a member of the, of the community asked, why aren't there prep centers of excellence within this community? Why aren't there some of these within this community? And the response that person had was, well, they didn't apply. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't be the response if you're talking about a medication that can prevent 99% of transmission. Should be, how could I help you get that grant money mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so your society can benefit from this? Mm -hmm. So I think we need to have more communication with regard, real open communication. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be honest about what, where the problem really lies. A lot of it is access. A lot of it is, mm -hmm. a lot of it is finding people to pay for these treatments. A lot of it is discrimination as well, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, we need to be, and we need to be honest. It's discrimination also that comes from providers. <laughs> a lot of providers do not want to deal with certain individuals because it takes too much time. And you only have 15 minutes a day per patient because that's what your administrators tell you to do. So we need to have open conversations and I think this is just the start of it. Mm -hmm. I really want to push for that ad hoc committee. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for that, Dr. King. I think what I, only, that my answer would really underscore what's already been said. I think in order to, I, th I think as I'm listening, I'm thinking about my girlfriend and uh, we, were at, we were at her house this, over this past couple weeks and uh, the, uh, the Gilead Truvada commercial came on. And she looked at me and she said, well, this is kind of like dumb and stupid. And I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, like, if this is preventing HIV, then why are we not all taking it like we're taking a multivitamin? And I said to her, well, my question is, did you even know before today? <laughs> right? Because that's a bigger question. When we do things in isolation, the outliers never find out what's happening. And therefore, they don't receive the benefit, right? I'm, I, as a black person, am never going to volunteer information to someone who I feel does not care about my experience or will help me through it. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not going to volunteer information to my doctor, my therapist, if I can get past my stigma and get one, or anyone else if I don't feel that they're going, not going to serve my purpose, if my purpose is to be as healthy as possible. We have large segments of our community that battle with this mistrust all the time. We don't, we don't trust institutions, we don't trust clinicians, and we dang sure don't trust medications. Mm -hmm. As black folks, we don't believe that solutions require biomedical medicine. Pills don't solve our problems. You will hear that frequently in the black community. You can't tell me that a pill solves my problem. Right, I'll put some. Right, I'll take some. Uh, I'll put some Vicks vapor rub on it. Yeah. <laughs> right, <laughs> I'll take a little bit of cough syrup. <laughs> I'll go lay down, take a nap. <laughs> but I'm not gonna take that pill mm -hmm. because that's the way of a, of a. That's the man's way of keeping me down. Mm -hmm. Right. We can't do anything without consistency, intervention, communication, and challenging bias. We cannot do anything. And we can't do anything without doing it consistently. We can't start a project, call it a pilot, and then stop once we determine it's a success. <laughs> we have to hold our, we, like Dr. King has very eloquently said, we have to hold our clinicians accountable. People who are living with HIV might not know how their HIV contributes to the other conditions that they are facing. What about your vision? What about your heart? What about your kidneys? What about your liver? A provider is supposed to explain those to you, but you may not really truly understand them because they may not be speaking your language, right? We don't see doctors, I, Lucky talked about having a lack of trans-friendly OBGYNs. I get that, and that breaks my heart. But OBGYNs that are seeing cisgender women are, asking, are not asking you all the time if you want to test for STIs. They're not asking you all the time if you want to test for HIV, because they don't really want to know you're having sex, because they don't really want to respond to it. They don't offer you biomedical prevention during pap smears, breast exams, or prostate checks. Right? So there's not this equitable place where people are have conversations that affirm their sex. We act, we come, people come in testing centers and we say things to them that, that really blows up mistrust by saying, you don't know what your partner's doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. While that may be true, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't affirm the trust that you have in your relationship, <laughs> right? And now you're speaking with someone who's not trusting your sex, not trusting your relationship, and not affirming the fact that you are trying to be in a committed space. But what we know is that cis women are most often exposed in the place that they trust the most, even if they've only slept with one person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what we don't take into account is sometimes, as cis women, we might play with our man. The room falls silent. <laughs> I say it again. Couples actually seek out other third-party sexual partners. It happens. And if two you can affirm that that is an experience and talk to me about it from a sex-positive perspective, you cannot effectively help me make healthier choices. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So we have another question, number three. You guys have been so incredible, I just have to say that. So can we just say that they've been incredible so far? It's amazing, amazing, amazing. And you, again, because of the way that it went, you may have answered some of this already, um, but here is the third question. In your opinion, what are the gaps and what are the barriers that are impeding progress in outreaching to, educating, and empowering black community to take note of the severity of the epidemic and taking ownership and responsibility for the solution? Before you start, though, the other thing that underneath there is about what's working right now. Are there things that are working? You know, are there things that you feel like are um, 
happening that actually are working? And then any other recommendations you give this panel? This is, I mean, this, this group, not this panel, this group about how to move things forward. And you've said some of them already, but I want to make sure that we get them from you because you guys have been so um, illuminating so far. So again, anybody who wants to begin with that one, please do. Yeah, Javante, please. Um, so um, as we know, there's many gaps and barriers um, that, we're, that we are faced with. Um, one of them is, uh, I'll speak from um, my peer group, is that I have the privilege of working in an intergeneration, intergenerational environment with older black gay men. Um, that has been around for a while, because um, you know, going back to the previous question, you know, I, I haven't been here for like 15 years, so um, there has been some things that has been done and and some progress, um, but you have to understand your history to know your present and to know what to do in the future. So, and I think that is one thing that my um, peer group is lacking, um, and that's so I feel like that's part of uh, one of the barriers that we are faced with. Um, another, um, as far as the black community goes, um, and something I stated earlier is that um, the conversation around HIV and testing is more so looked at as being a gay thing, so the conversation is not being had. And also, if an individual is to become positive, how do you deal with that? Because we're not even talking about testing, we sure are not talking about what, it, what does it mean to live in a day -to -day, your day-to-day -day life as being an HIV positive person mm -hmm. and how do you be, you know, how do your family deal with that? How do your peers deal with that? Um, so um, those are just two of the, the gaps and barriers. And, you know, one of the solutions that I feel like we can do is to impl implement a broad community um, intervention to where we um, address uh, various aspects of the community and, and bring the community in and, and touch on these different things and have those conversations as to what needs to be done and to address it and to actually make sure that it is intergenerational to where we have um, people that has been doing this for some time as well as people who are living through it um, in their day to day currently. Thank you. Please. I think with um, the impact of HIV on, on the trans community as a whole, right? So this is something that we hear about and, and we're aware of, and, and, and these, is, these are conversations that happen within the trans community. Um, I think that right now we do have quite a few clinics that are trans, uh, trans specific clinics, right? But they, it's, it's not nearly enough mm -hmm clinics to, to handle the caseload of trans people, right? So we have maybe a handful of these clinics that service trans folks around transitional needs and HIV care and, and PrEP, and we have all these offshoots that, that offer the PrEP, and the trans community is very aware of the different, the different ways that PrEP works and the different mm -hmm. preventions and whatnot. But without safe entries to care, mm -hmm. like that's gonna always be a barrier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. without without networks of of competent con clinicians that that know how to handle trans folks on a level to understand the different intersectionalities that come with those folks mm -hmm. even more so for people of color right black folks mm -hmm. so there's that trauma informed care has mm -hmm. to come with mm -hmm. that that other medical piece that has to come with the the HIV piece. So being trauma informed and knowing that a lot of those clients that are coming to you that are trans and that are black, there are so many different traumas that come with them that also need to be addressed. Um, and and there needs to be models that are developed of inclusive care within the trans community so that there are spaces that they feel safe in, there are spaces that they know that they can go and be okay. Say, okay, you know, I'm going to this clinic and we need more clinics because the ones that we have are so impacted that getting a, 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 an appointment is like, okay, well, I see you in two weeks, but what about what I'm doing right now? 
What about the, the risk that I'm taking now? What about mm -hmm. these risks? We have um, our, our trans sisters that do engage in survival sex. We do have um, trans brothers that also engage in survival sex. Mm -hmm. And so if folks understood that not only do, do trans women and our, our non-binary folks need those, those supports, but trans men, especially black trans men, because remember, we're walking through the world as black men mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. Okay, as black men first. So we're gonna get that stigma off top first. Then we add the intersectionality of being trans, the intersectionality of our culture. So all of those things are gonna play into that. And if we got clinicians that understood those intersectionalities and understood how to be trauma-informed around those particular issues, I think that the care would come across and, and we would actually access that care. It's not that we don't want to, it's not that we can't. It's that there's no safe space for us to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm listening to this conversation. I'm thinking in my head, maybe Dr. Spencer can help us as well. Um, I mean, in LA, we're kind of an embarrassment of riches with regards to African-American HIV specialists. I can think about eight off the top of my head. Okay, I can think of eight HIV, African-American HIV specialists surrounding LA County, but again, some of the areas that we are still in still have some of the highest numbers with regards to African-Americans and HIV care, excuse me, and HIV um, uh, epidemiology. And there's a disconnect there. I look at San Francisco, and maybe Mario can talk to this a little bit later in his presentation, but the issue of, uh, of a program such as uh, Rapid Start might be instrumental. Now, again, maybe we don't have the transportation infrastructure, we don't have the, some of the other infrastructures that San Francisco has, but there's no reason why we cannot kind of implement these kind of systems. Where someone, as soon as they're tested by Javante, are given a warm handoff, and that day they're started on HIV medications. And we've seen that there's very little resistance that's been transmitted, and very little resistance by that. And there is higher uh, levels of uh, suppression. There's earlier uh, levels of suppression that happen. Some of these medications can cause a two log drop in the viral load within 10 days. So imagine, if we're talking about U equals U, the idea of being undetectable, being untransmittable, imagine what we can do with that. We get somebody actually on medications that same day. Also, one of the things that we're talking about, I think we're kind of glossed over, is mental health. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. I cannot, you're talking about an ob I cannot find a mental health provider, psychiatrist, that takes uh, insurance. So if somebody does come to me and they have all these other issues of substance abuse, bipolar disorder, adjustment disorder because of new diagnoses, trauma, I can't take care of all that. And I have nowhere to actually send that individual in the immediate area. Some of the, the IPAs that I contract with were located in Crenshaw. The closest one is out there in Downey. I'm not going to Downey. <laughs> I barely want to come to you. <laughs> That's what I hear all the time. So we need, if we're really going to talk compensate this, we need to talk to our managed care contractors, our managed care organizations. If they are making a specific request to have HIV specialists, they need to also encompass everything else that comes with it. That is psychiatrists, that is psychologists, that is endocrinologists that deal with uh, gender trans transition as well. That is OB kind, trans friendly individuals as well. We're offered incentives with regards to making sure people's hemoglobin A1C, which is the screenings for diabetes, is under seven. We want their LDLs, which is their bad cholesterol, to be under 100. We want, if they're diabetic, we want them to go to eye doctors and the foot doctors as well. The incentives should also be for viral loads. The incentives should also be for how many times they come to our offices as well too. But yet we also need the tools to deal with, to try to, be, to retain these individuals in. 
The last thing I want to say, I mean, want, oh, wow. I see, I see the baby over there. <laughs> the last thing I wanted to say, Yolanda brought up the issue of discrimination. And we need to have honest conversations, and I think this is a safe environment that we should start, mm. well, we should try to make this a safe environment so we can start having actual conversations about discrimination, particularly with our consumers that come to this individual, this place. I've toyed with the idea of having a green book for providers as well, but I know that's going to be some mm -hmm. legal mm -hmm. complications that will mm -hmm. occur with that. Mm -hmm. But it does happen. Mm -hmm. It does occur. And the final thing I think we need to do is that we need to, whenever you point your finger out, you've got three fingers pointing back at you, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think the African American Greek organizations, Kappas, <laughs> the Deltas, you know, we need to really treat this as more than just one day. Right? We need, and we need funding, and we need to be able to take that money that we take for these big regional meetings that we do, big national meetings that we do, all the dressing that we do, and put it into some services and partner with local organizations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. We need to support our church ministries. A lot of churches, particularly the mega churches, we're not we're not touching this we're not touching this topic at all. Now, through the offer, through the work of people like Mrs. Spears and other organizations, we have HIV ministries, but they need support. They need guidance. They need more education. We need to partner with them because that money comes in, and that money can come right to your organization, not just. To certain organ, other organizations, that come to your organizations as well, too. We need to have realistic conversations with the HIV ministries. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hmm. I think you can tell from this conversation and hopefully just from living every day that the reality of the black community is that we're just dealing with more than HIV. We spend a great deal of resources continuing patterns of programming and conversations that don't consider equity. We're fighting institutions and sometimes ourselves. We <laughs> fail to increase the sustainability at times of, organiz of indigenous organizations or fight for the injustices that the injustice fight against the injustices that contribute to our poorer health outcomes. So, as I mentioned earlier, there just has to be strategy organization and commitment in communication. We must be strategic in our efforts to fight for poverty, injustice, police brutality, environmental health, harm reduction, racism, and mass incarceration, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? We must equip our people with skills necessary to thrive in a society in a meaningful way that is often felt like it's against us. It also includes making sure that you help us deal and we help ourselves deal with historical trauma, substance use. But guess what? What about professional development? Mm. What about housing insecurity, right? So we have to break the resistance towards research and engage in systemic changes that push for resources that are actually timely and responsive but not segmented in a way where the outliers never get touched. We have to have difficult conversations that people will not take personal accountability for, particularly as it relates to race. Do I need to say that louder and in bold font? <laughs> okay, hopefully the people in the back heard that. <laughs> Technically, I'm gonna leave it at this. What is working now? We're having this conversation, but if we don't do anything later, then it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to do a quick time check. How much time do we have left in this hour and 10 minutes that we were given? I want to make sure that we're, huh? It's been about an hour, okay. So we have about 10 more minutes then. So question number four, no, I'm kidding. They're looking at me like, what? There's no question number four. There's no question, what? So um, 
we did want to give you some time uh, here to ask a couple of questions from the groups that have been listening to this really incredibly illuminating conversation from all uh, four of you, of the panelists. So before we do that, before we do that, I want to just mention Tracy, Dr. King, Lucky, Javante, you have just described an incredible range of the complexities that people are facing in black communities. You talked about recommendations, you talked about advocacy, you talked about some of the struggle that has been historical and continuing and impacts HIV to this day. And to that, I just wanna, before we get to it, I just thank you for that because it was a beautiful conversation. Really, truly. And I'm so glad that you're filming it because a lot of the things that you said, I think people should go back to and really listen and take in and think about how they can make some movement in the work that they're doing, uh, whether it's their individual work or the collective work of this commission, because they've given a lot of incredible recommendations. So we have a couple of minutes and um, I wanna open it up to questions. I, I see, and I, yes, everybody gets where I, I just wanna make sure that I'm doing, doing the right a, thing. I'm doing the right thing. Let's take a list. Uh, put your cards up. Yeah. Okay. 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 So it's uh, Kevin and then Frankie. You guys, amazing. Uh, Greg, great job. This should be our next annual meeting topic is black and brown communities and how these kind of panels are really informative. Um, Tracy talked about, place, well, I want to say one thing first. It's a comment that I think is a commission we need to focus on is how do we get DHSP to work with the providers, the contracted agencies to do MOUs with people like Dr. King to help fulfill their mission. Because a lot of these programs were set up in communities that now are not as highly impacted as the communities we're talking about. And we can't wait for Dr. King to get a grant writer because he can't afford that. But we can use our current resources and our current structure to, have, to force them to reach out to provide some of these services and support some of these services in the black and brown community. And I think that we need to figure out how to do that. And it's another way for us to spend more dollars, which is a problem that we keep having. <clears throat> and Tracy, you talked about places and spaces and Dr. King, you mentioned the churches and I did some like research last night in, in opening up this conversation. You know, African-Americans are, it's, I think the numbers I looked at last night were 82% of African-Americans attend church at least once a month or every week. And 52% it was every week, um, much, much higher than other communities. And also their, um, their participation rates, and it's also skews much low, um, younger. The demographic of people that go to church in the African-American communities are much younger than in the regular other communities. So my question is, Dr. King, to your point, engaging the churches, how, do, how would we do that? How, how, what, how do you engage the churches to help with stigma, to help with education, and make that a part of the, the sermon, if you will? Well, first of all, I'm one of the 18% that doesn't go every, every month. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I do, uh, but I have spoken at churches as well. I think that you invite them. And if I've been thinking correctly this morning I, or when I got the invitation to come here, I would have invited some of those individuals to come here. Um, and I will extend um, an invitation to some of the church leaders as well to come here. Uh, the, the, we have the HIV ministry. This, those of you who know Mrs. Spear, she's everywhere. Anytime there's a meeting about issues of HIV and, and African American, she's there. And um, she would have been a welcome component of this panel, I think. Um, but also, I think the, and then from there, that conversation with those HIV ministries, if it comes from the, leader, the leadership or from a selected ad hoc group of individuals, they come speak to them and let them know what the commission is about. But I'd be happy to, to make that, that initial introduction. All right, thank you. So help me get to the order of things. Okay, so um, Frankie and then Yolanda, and then we could take some questions from the public, and then you can go around. Okay. Hi, Frankie. Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, I don't know how to ask this exactly. Sometimes, so what I, as someone that provides services in the community. Yo, yo, yo. Mm -hmm. Check. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, as like a service provider, I feel like the mistrust that the community has is really valid from a historical standpoint. When we talk about the experimentation of black bodies, J. Marion Sims, a father of gynecology experimenting on, fo on black folks. We talk about you know soldiers that our military was experimenting on. The, it, I feel like the mistrust is, is valid and the discrimination is very valid from a historical standpoint. And this is like 400 years of historical oppression, right? So my question is where, what are very practical steps we can take as service providers to have very simple things we can do to really establish that trust um, to kind, I mean, no, it's not gonna fix, it's not gonna fix it, but really trying to have that intervention there to kind of establish that relationship. Thank you. I think the reality is, is that historical trauma is very real, as you mentioned, and I thank you for validating that. Um, I think it's something that we often don't discuss or, or even very, some people, lots of people in this room probably just learned even just a tiny bit the way you framed your question. I, th I think we have to first have an understanding and an attitude that the experience is valid. Okay, we cannot create change if we don't take into context that it is a valid experience. And that valid experience, even though it may be 400 years ago, 300 years ago, it shaped a culture. It shaped a perspective that we carry generationally and contributes to how we participate and show up. We were taught those things from our grandparents, from our parents. Right? So, so if we believe in social learning theory, we can believe that, these, that those 400 years ago have a very true presence in this room right now. Right? So how do you do that? You show up in a way that is culturally appropriate, culturally respectful, consistent. You do not evade or invalidate people's realities, you continue to put your ego aside. And I'm going to say that again for the bigger providers in the room. You put your big egos aside. You respect that there are indigenous people and organizations within the community trying to encourage change and trying to inform change. You invest in those places and people, right? You don't assume you know it all because you had a white boyfriend or a black boyfriend. But guess what? If I am a Caucasian person, I'm gonna say it right here. I have Caucasian friends, I love my people. But I get tired of them looking at me saying they had a black boyfriend and they understand me. If that is your exclusive experience of black folks, then do your research. <laughs> That's where I'm going to leave it. All right. <laughs> That's a good way to leave it. <laughs> so one, again, are there, there's people at the table that you wanted to? Yeah, Yolanda. Um, you can get. Yeah, there's. Uh... Yeah, there's. Um, just good morning and making a statement and, and moving forward and to my fellow commissioners, I do apologize for my absence. I think that you guys may be able to see why, um, but we were determined to be here today. So my first statement, just in talking just a little bit about black history and Kevin, you talked about churches, right? Well, you have to go back to during the times of slavery Church was the only time or opportunity that we were given to gather for kinship, for friendship, and, and worship. We weren't allowed. We didn't read, right? And so our master only spoke verses from the Bible to us. And so that has followed as a tradition years and hundreds of years, okay? 
That's number one. Education, and when we talk about the black community, the black community is suffering. When I tried to find schooling for my child in the community where I live, it was difficult. A black teacher met me at the front door and she said, don't bring your child here. And so when we talk about what the black community is facing and in that pocket within the city of Los Angeles, it goes back deeper than just HIV. We're talking about the determinants of health. We're talking about education and especially poverty. So this is a very, very special community, right? And everyone understands that. So moving forward in what it is that I want to say specifically is that Number one, it is about follow through. I've been here at the table for now four years and I've not seen the innovation. We're all working very hard and tirelessly and I will not deny that at all. But when we're talking about major strides and challenges, we have to really start doing. One question would be, how many times have we gone before the Board of Supervisors to really talk about this issue that's facing the black community, to move forward in policy that will spark some change? I don't know that answer specifically, but I certainly would like to get that answer. Because we cannot do anything if we're not moving forward with the powers that be. And it starts from our executive director, board of supervisors, and Mario. We've got to go back to policy in terms of where these dollars come from. And so discrimination is present when you have Dr. King, when the HIV community knows that he is present and to not support with dollars. It's a clear message, but it's not only happening in his office, it's everywhere. So when do we begin to, to spark that change and that difference? Secondly, I've been here four years and I have to be the Martin Luther King, the Sojourner Truth, the, um, God forgive me, give me some names, Sojourner Truth, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks. I have to be that woman today and say, why are we've got to stand up? We're not really wanted at the table. We are here to fulfill specific numbers. We need African Americans on this body. We need women, we need men. And I, I came here hoping that there was change. And four years ago, someone said to me, Yolanda, it will never happen. And I said to her, you don't know what you're talking about. I thought I could make a difference. That was to Tracy Bivens Davis. I apologize to you. You were right. So moving forward, we're rolling over 3.2 million MIA dollars yet again. So I say to this body, I want to move forward and I, I don't know how, Al, a caucus, a body for African Americans so that we can begin to move forward with policy if the change will not happen anywhere else. That's number one. And to make that caucus just as important as the consumer caucus or any other program so that those meetings are counted as an active caucus. The same moving forward for the women's caucus. Make those caucuses important. If I can attend one caucus meeting and with the output, guys, you've got to move forward with policy. You should have seen the things that I've had to traverse since being diagnosed with HIV, with housing. And I come to this table because I want change. I want change. That's why I'm here, because at this point, I want nor do I need anything from anyone in this room. I was determined not to fail. And even when the white towel was in my hand, Mario, I said I cannot stop. Thank you for that. And I need you to answer for us today, why is there a lack of programming for African Americans and how do we increase that programming? Thank you. 
So trying to be mindful of time, I do want to give um, the audience um, the opportunity to ask questions. Sure. We'll take three questions. Please make them questions. Um, and then we'll move on to the break. I know, I know, Greg. I know, and I, I have you. Hi. Um, check, check, match. Check, check, check. Hi, my name is Amaya Wilson. I'm from Selma, Alabama, and I was raised in a church. My father is a minister. And I wanted to ask you because it just, for me, you talked about like the money and the funds. Why aren't we going to the churches? The churches that are here are like magnificent. So I know the money is like there. And I just feel like you said that you go and speak at the churches. I mean, since it started in a church, why can't we go back to the church and request or politely ask, you know, okay, these are the things it needs. These are the statistics. This is what our community need as black people. Can I, thank you for that question. Can, I'm, I'm sure Dr. King has some, some things he would wanna add and I'm actually startled by the statistics that Kevin Stalter um, mentioned a little earlier. I am also of the, one of those people who do not go to church every month. Um, but uh, no, and I have had several church homes. And what I can say as a bedside Baptist <laughs> is that everybody's experience in the church is not a good one. Everybody's church has not accepted or affirmed who they are as individual people and the choices that they make in the context of their lives. So therefore, we cannot assume that the church will be our savior. We also have to acknowledge that even though black folks have history deeply rooted in churches, as black folks, we came to this country and were pushed into a church and we're not allowed to indigenously acknowledge and celebrate the religions of our ancestors. In order to really provide adequate services, we have to acknowledge that as true. We can't pretend like that did not happen. And that is a part of historical trauma. When is the last time you've been to your church and you saw a trans-identified person who felt they could be open, honest, and accepted within the congregation? Right. I have churches that I belong to that are beautiful places. There are beautiful places and there are beautiful people in them. But if I mention the word penis as if nobody has one, <laughs> or mention the word that people are sexually active when they go home, then I'm not accepted for that conversation. I have to deny a part of the reality of this experience of HIV in order to be culturally appropriate within the space. And I have to be a different person every congregation I go to to accept the norms of that church in order to even have the conversation. So I'm going to say that while church is a place where we congregate, and clearly, basically, according to Kevin, many of us go, <laughs> I cannot ignore that probably the people who need it the most will not be accepted there, do not feel welcome there, and are not going to show up there. <clears throat> but I do go and speak. Because <laughs> money's still free. I would approach churches that have an HIV ministry. There are, there are leaders, certain leaders within the community as well, where there are certain pastors who have met together to talk about these type of issues, to talk about health, and have incorporated HIV, have incorporated di di uh, diabetes, hypertension, disparities in care. There is that disconnect between what is in, said to be in the Bible and what is actually reality. So a lot of pastors are struggling with that as well. I'm not a pastor, I'm not a deacon, but I have done work with the, with the churches. The other thing, there are open churches. There are open churches within the Los Angeles community that, res that respect everyone. 
And these are the churches, unfortunately, that have been presented with the ideas when the mega churches have had to bury people who are HIV positive. They've had to done the eulogy. They were transported to them. So those are the churches I think that you want to start with, to work with. Now those are the churches that have a little bit of, that have little money. Yes, yeah. So, yeah, those are the churches that have the little money. The big churches, the big mega churches, that's going to be hard. That's going to be hard to break in unless you are a Magic Johnson. That's just my opinion. I, I, that's a that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but there are, but I would, I, yeah, yeah. The building. We have time for a couple more. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Ronald Jackson, and I just kind of want to bring it back to the grassroots and to the streets. Whereas we have some agencies that actually do the work with young black men, or just black men, the black community in general. But I test people, and I've been working with people for the past 20 years. It started with people dying in the, in the, um, in the community. And we brought up Ms. Spears. I want to bring up Kevin Spears because he was the one many, many years ago that kind of made sure that the uh, waiting rooms for people that was HIV positive were very comfortable and respectful of them in their situations. And so what I want to talk about today is, and I have a question, is in talking to black men on a daily basis and those that I've been able to re-engage into care. You know, the concern is when they get to that doctor's office or when they get to that agency that's there to help them, they're not really helping them. Mm. They're not really giving them the services that they need. They're not really respecting them as a human being, first off. So why would I want to come to you for some medical services when you're not even giving me the proper respect that I deserve? So Dr. King, you mentioned something that was very good, you know, just that adherence and this really being respectful of the individuals that come through that door and really knowing how to talk to them, how to speak to them correctly and make them feel comfortable. Because the goal is to get them on medication, to get them adherence to care. So how do we make sure that these agencies and doctor's offices are receiving the people that I'm referring there for care? How do we make sure that they are getting the proper care that they need? What happens when you have somebody that you, do you hand walk them to that office? I have the ability to hand walk them, but oftentimes I hand them. Okay. Years ago when I was at THC Clinic, a, uh, Richard Hamilton actually hand walked patients when he was at Mapping, hand walked patients into that office. And I thought that was, at first I didn't understand what was going on. <laughs> right? But I thought that was a very effective way to make sure the people that he tested actually were there, and also to make sure that they were treated appropriately as well, too. I think we still, we call them, now we have it, we've, we've uh, codified it and called them patient navigators. But it started, I think, with individuals like yourself and Richard who were vested in the community and wanted to make sure that their, their fellow individuals were treated appropriately. I welcome you to come talk to me afterwards and we can talk about how we can try to make those warm handoffs happen in my office if possible. And that's one of the ways we can start. We can move just from this conversation we have, and I leave it here at the table. We could try to see if we can implement that, and how I can get you with some of my other providers as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Beck Levin, and I'm actually a recent transplant from San Francisco uh, to Los Angeles. Um, and it, I worked uh, in the HIV field up there. Uh, specifically, I worked on the National SPINS Initiative, the HIV Housing and Employment Project. Um, and one of the things that as uh, the director of that program that we ran into, specifically, uh, this question, sorry, is for Lucky. Um, one of the things that we ran into was um, that we were trying to advocate really hard for our trans clients because I'm gender non-binary, I go by they, them pronouns, and um, just because it's the right thing to do. And there the questions were very culturally incompetent uh, for that evaluation initially, so we really fought to have the questions more culturally competent. And there was marginal victories, for example, instead of just asking what is your gender, like trans male, trans female, blah, 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 blah. They asked uh, what sex were you assigned at birth? What uh, sex do you identify as now? Um, but they still added like trans man, trans uh, women on, on that second question. I'm like, well, trans women and trans men are men and women, so whatever. Um, but 
Uh, all that's to say, uh, when we're running, when running up against uh, pro like programs and um, stigmatizing evaluations like that, where it's like a national study or um, something scientific, and uh, the main excuse kind of is used of, well, this is uh, this is um, this is tested this. This questionnaire has been tested. This questionnaire has been used nationally. So we're going to just stick with the exact verbiage because it's just kind of how it is. Um, how do we successfully advocate for um, people of color and then also our trans community and um, all our other wonderful intersectional communities uh, for better care in that setting, I guess? Well, um, one thing that we've we've discovered, I've doing I've been doing a lot of the cultural competency training within different uh, fields, whether it's um, homeless shelters or mental health. And one thing that we we definitely um, encourage a lot of the agencies to do is change what that form looks like, because trans is a a self identifier. Leave that open. Let, let allow folks to identify the way that they choose to identify. Um, and ask them what their pronouns are. Be more inclusive in the languaging that you use when you sit down and you talk to these clients. Um, have that compassion and understand that coming in, um, a lot of times our trans folks, because their identity a lot of times is used against them as, as like this weapon, right? Because once they find out, for, for me example, right? Once folks find out that I'm trans, it's like, oh my God, no way. Right, and so then at that point it's used against me. So if if you are very trauma informed when it comes to that, and don't use that identity, and be very compassionate and very gentle when it comes to those identity pieces, allow them to identify the way that they choose. Okay, because trans is already a self identifier. As well, for California in particular, we have the third gender law. Okay, so it's law. All of you have to change your, your intakes forms regardless. They have to be inclusive. It's part of the law, okay? SB uh, 396 made it law, okay? So with that being said, um, it's all about languaging. It's all about that compassion. It's all about how you approach the situation and making those folks feel comfortable and validated and affirmed. Thank you. Thank you, thanks. So one more time, I want, I think everybody in the panel has said this, that they've given you a number of recommendations, talked about the complexities, and really are talking about how can you move this forward? Not just this is a conversation that we have and it was interesting, but how can this group move forward with many of the things that people have been talking about so that things are changing or things change? So I'm hoping that that has happened with all of you at the commission and then the people who are listening here. And one last time, I wanna thank Javante, Lucky, Dr. King, and Tracy for an incredible panel. Thank you very much for doing this. And before we close out the panel, um, for one, thank you all. And secondly, I'd like to thank Jeffrey King for presenting the panel idea initially and also formulating all of the questions. Please give Jeffrey a round of applause. And I'm looking forward to seeing how we continue this conversation. Thank you.